Today I am going to talk to you about three things. Three things I wish that I knew about EMDR uh, before I embarked on the treatment. Uh, they're not all bad. I made it sound like they were all going to be bad. They're not. Uh, spoiler alert. Happy ending. I'm still here. Yay. Um, yeah, so EMDR. Um, so the, the context for this video is that um, I was having a look at some of my old videos and seeing what was popular and weirdly the video on EMDR is my most popular video right now uh, which was a surprise because it was a long and rambling kind of talk about my experience of EMDR but I think what the thing is is that I made that video because there wasn't a lot out there about e EMDR uh, and clearly a lot of other people found the same thing and so when looking for something anything they found my rambling um, and some of you found it helpful so I'm really pleased about that. So to give this a bit of context, I am going to be sharing my experiences of EMDR as a patient, not as a professional. Uh, being the geek that I am and someone who works in the field of mental health I have read all the literature and when I say all the literature I mean basically this this book um, I mean there's other stuff too but this this is this is the the, the book um, by the way that was a really perfect example of why my books are color coded I get a lot of hate and some love for my color codedness of my books um, and it's partly an aesthetic thing. I've grown to really love it. And some days when I'm really anxious, it really calms me to put my books into exact order of hue. And I, I know that's not quite normal. Um, but the reason why I started it was because I was um, recording a series of webinars for the health for Health Education England when I worked at the Charlie Waller Memorial Trust. Shout out to a great charity. Um, and I would, in the middle of these webinars, suddenly want to recommend a book. And I could never find the book I was looking for. Um, and the only way I found of being able to reliably find the books I'm looking for is to put them in order of hue, because I remember what they look like rather than what they're called or who the authors are. Um, sorry if you're an author of a book that I love, but I probably do remember its cover more than I remember you, and I'm sorry about that. Anyhow. That book I'd recommend if you're a geek and you like to read the detail, um, that is like the, the seminal text on EMDR uh, written by the mother of EMDR. So what the hell is EMDR? Um, it is eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy um, and it is an approved treatment for trauma essentially. So I have post-traumatic stress disorder. That's not quite true. Actually I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder disorder, which is even more fun. Um, it's kind of the same thing, but it means that you uh, have maybe more complex symptoms and they're related not to one event, um, but to perhaps a series of events or ongoing trauma over a period of time. It's quite common in people who have experienced neglect or abuse in childhood. Um, I won't go into the details of that right now. Hmm. Anyway, so EMDR, yeah, it's the approved therapy. Um, and basically, I didn't embark on it for a really long time because I was really skeptical because I read about it and I was like, how the heck could that possibly work? Because basically, you're sitting in a room with a therapist and the therapist is making you look at either lights or their fingers and you're basically just looking back and forth and back and forth and back and forth whilst recalling really, really, really traumatic stuff. Um, and that sounded really really horrible for one um, and secondly like well what why why would that make any difference to me like I'm I've upset myself whilst like moving my eyes around a bit hmm uh, yeah <laughs> but um, you know there there does happen to be a really good evidence base despite um, how strange it sounds um, and and really I was getting desperate to be quite honest um, I tried everything um, and my life was still ruled by post-traumatic stress disorder and so I was willing to give this final thing a go um, and ditto my therapist was also kind of skeptical about it as well um, but he too really wanted to help me we'd been working together a really long time and despite the fact he's really good and 
quite expensive. Um, we we kind of yeah kept on making good progress, and then I would go right back to the start again and get really ill with anorexia or whatever. And um, yeah, so we thought we'd try something different. So he went and trained up in EMDR, and I um, yeah became his first patient. So. Yeah, so the point of this video, three things I wish I knew about EMDR before I embarked on the treatment. Um, so the first one, I wish, I wish, above anything probably, I wish I'd known it was going to work. Um, I didn't, I didn't, you know, engage in the treatment for a really long time. I was really reluctant to do it, even when then I agreed to do it. It took me quite a while to actually finally really press go. Uh, I did quite a lot of preparing for it and prevaricating and all sorts. And I think really, I was sort of aware that this was maybe not my last chance at getting better, but it was like the one thing I, I hadn't tried that was a known entity that was meant to work. And I guess I was a bit worried that it might not work and then where would that leave me? And I was beginning to feel quite hopeless. Um, and so, yeah, I wish I would have known it would worked. Also, I wish I'd known it was gonna work because then I think I might have done it sooner. I might have been a little bit more willing and able to put up with the, the difficulties, which I'll come on to, uh, that came with the treatment. Um, and I think I also might have been a bit more willing to kind of like put my life on pause for the amount of time that it took to do the treatment in the knowledge that, you know, X months hence, everything will be rosy, la di da di da skip off into the sunshine. That's not how it ends actually, but you know, it was kind of a bit like that. It really did make a big difference and, and quite quickly after a horrific blah at the beginning. I need coffee. By the way, I'm really sorry if you can hear in the background a lot of noise. So sometimes people talk about how in my videos, if you listen really carefully, sometimes in the background, you can hear birds singing. I do a lot of work to try and bring birds into my garden. I love them. I spend a lot of money on bird food. Um, However, today, if you listen really carefully, you can hear the sound of workmen who are installing, believe it or not, solar panels onto my mother-in-law's roof. Um, because South London, you know, we get so much sun. Um, yeah, yeah, and I don't live with my mother-in-law. Not that that would be a problem if I did. I have done, she is fab. We happen to be neighbors. And yes, that is my choice. And yes, I like it and it's great. Okay, back to the point. Number two of the things I wish I knew before I had EMDR. Number two, I wish I had known and had a full appreciation of the fact it was going to get worse. No, like worse, 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 really worse before it got better. So for me, I did not embark on this therapy until a point at which I was relatively well. Now, this is, yeah, this is a spectrum. <laughs> I'd been incredibly unwell, on and off, largely incredibly unwell if we're honest, for the preceding few years, um, and had, at the point at which I embarked on the EMDR therapy, I had been discharged from hospital maybe six months previously, uh, having reached for the first time in my life a healthy weight um, and that was good and things were going quite well. Um, I was beginning to enjoy my work again. I was beginning to have fun with my family again. I had new hobbies, climbing. You've probably heard me mention climbing. I was climbing um, and I was learning piano and I was, yeah, life was really kind of peachy and particularly in comparison to where it had been in the previous few months and years um, and so things were going yeah pretty okay now we kind of knew I needed to be really strong before I embarked on the trauma therapy. So there's a few different things going on here. So one, when you're really underweight with anorexia, which I basically was chronically for decades actually, but particularly underweight in those previous few years and more so at some points than others. But 
when your brain is really like starved and your body's very underweight, you can't really do processing of complex thoughts and engaging with complex therapy. You're essentially trying to use a brain which is starved to do complex things and it doesn't work. So like, yeah, when you're anorexic, and this is with no disrespect to anyone who is struggling from the illness, and maybe you will recognise this in yourself if you're trying really hard to get better, you're basically, you've got the, the kind of cognitive capacity of, of quite a small child because your brain is totally, totally, totally starved and it can't do complex things. It's really back to basics um, and it does strange things as well. I mean, anorexia does make strange thoughts happen. Anyway, every, so yeah, the brain thing is bad when you're, when you're very underweight, so that's not good. So I needed to get to a healthy weight in order for my brain to work properly, so that was important. The other thing was I needed to be like in a stable and supportive uh, and good place uh, so that, you know, if this threw up some tricky stuff, because I was, after all, going to finally be exploring some things I'd never explored before, um, I needed to know that that was going to be okay um, and that I'd be able to manage that, that I was in a place both like literally and metaphorically uh, to deal with the fallout there. Um, and so I prepared for all this and I waited until things were going relatively well. So I actually, you know, full on knew, hey, things are going quite well now. Let's engage in this hideous therapy. It was an active choice. I didn't realise though at all how much worse things were going to get before they got better. Um, and I say it's a thing I wish I'd knew. I guess part of me, maybe, if I'd have known, I mean, I was probably the m most suicidal I've ever been. Uh, I don't know. That's a tough one to call. I was, I was actively suicidal quite a lot of the time, like had to put really, really careful safety plans in place. Talking of which, I will link to a really good safety planning website by my good pal and amazingly respected colleague Alice Cole King in the link below because it's a really good way of planning. If you are worried about yourself or someone else and suicide, it's really, really straightforward. I'll link to that. Anyhow, back to the point. So yeah, I had to put really good safety planning in place around suicide side. Um, so you imagine the scenario. I've just got back into my role of wife, of mom, of friend, of co-worker, of everything. And then I embark on this therapy, my choice, and I basically have to step back from all those roles because hang on a minute, I'm back to managing one minute at a time all over again. And it was, honestly, it was hell. It was just a complete, I mean, and actually in a way, because things had been so much better and I'd had a little bit of a taste of what life could be like, and in many ways it was my first taste of what life could be like, um, really, um, yeah, that made it all the more sour going back to this really difficult place. However, it was really super temporary. So it didn't feel super temporary at the time, but looking back at it now, it'll be coming up to a year soon actually. Um, and it felt like it was going on forever, but it was actually a period of weeks. Um, and my therapist during both the individual sessions and over the course of the, the sessions as a set of things, uh, he talked to me always about how like, if you're, um, <laughs> sorry, I'll tell you the joke in a minute. If you're in a car, in a tunnel, um, and you need to get through the tunnel, like you might be scared and your instinct might be to pull over to the side, but actually the best way to get through the tunnel is just to keep steady, keep your foot on the gas and keep driving. Um, and that's the best way to get through. Sorry, my laughter was because actually that wasn't the analogy my therapist made. My therapist who has known me for years uh, made the analogy um, of being in a train and going through a tunnel um, and um, that doesn't work for me because I am absolutely, absolutely not able to go near trains because I have really awful, obsessive, um, compulsive um, thoughts around them that get me into trouble sometimes um, and yeah, could end up being really dangerous. So yeah, but um, yeah, you know, you laugh or you cry. Anyhow, yeah, so 
I wish I'd known it was going to get much worse before it got better and maybe more than that I wish I'd known that 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 worse would be like I needed to know the extent of that worse perhaps so I could have better prepared for it I needed to like fully know like you're really gonna have to take a step back from everything prepare for that properly not the kind of semi preparing that I'd done um, but also um, I, I needed to maybe know that would be really temporary so like you know you need to take a step back from everything for like a month six weeks it, it's it's you know in the scheme of my life it's a really short period of time felt like a long time at the time was a short time in, in the scheme of things and it now feels a distant memory um, the third one um, the third thing I wish I'd known about EMDR before I embarked on the therapy um, which would have really helped me and perhaps made me engage sooner and more willingly uh, is that I wouldn't actually have to talk about anything I didn't want to talk about so for me the the trauma therapy was particularly terrifying because there was all this stuff that even with my therapist who I had by this point known for an incredibly long time and who I trusted implicitly um, but there was stuff that I hadn't even talked with him about um, stuff I'd never said out loud, stuff I'd never really even thought about how it would sound out loud, you know? Um, and, and things, I was really terrified of voicing um, and yeah, I was really, really scared about all of that. And actually with EMDR, or well, certainly with the way that my therapist did it with me, I didn't have to say anything I didn't want to. In fact, you know, I spent most of, most of my sessions more or less entirely mute. There was some prompting and there was a lot going on in my head, but actually I didn't say very much at all. And that was largely because I was so traumatized. I was barely able to, to get the words together, but there was a lot of work that happened uh, both during and uh, around the sessions that, that allowed me to uh, process. I mean, it's, it's literally, as it sounds, it's a reprocessing therapy. So it's about bringing these things to mind. It's not about saying them out loud and evaluating them. It's basically like, with trauma, you you it's like your memories are a jumble of um, trying to think what's the really great analogy my therapist always used. So it's like the cupboard. You've got a cupboard full of tins and everything's all in a jumble. Um, and so the you know you open the door and the tins keep falling out at times when you don't want them. So like I'm walking along down the street and the tiniest thing happens and I'm into startle mode because something has prompted this kind of you know tr this memory and made me feel like I'm in danger right now when actually the thing that I'm worried about happened 30 years ago or something um, and so what this therapy does is it takes all the tins out it puts them probably in color order in my case I'm thinking I don't know so yeah it puts things back in order and they don't all fall out at unopportune times and yeah you can go visit the cupboard and pick out the tin you want when you want it then but it's not going to tumble out at the you know when you don't want it to basically so yes you're, you're more in control of those those thoughts those feelings those memories um, so yeah, I didn't have to talk about anything I didn't want to. Actually, what I found was as I worked through the therapy um, that I began to want to write about some of these things and I made some really big breakthroughs where I would write stuff down and then I would choose to share it with my therapist. Um, and the outside of the sessions mainly, I did begin to talk about some of this. I mean, I did talk about it with my therapist too, but a lot of those conversations happened actually like out of the therapy. So I would talk to my therapist but often I'd find actually then I'd want to explore it more. Um, I started to want to talk about it. I say want, I, it wasn't like, hey, I've got this story I want to tell. It was more like I kind of felt a need to or I wanted to explore, I guess, it's hard to explain. So many of the very difficult thoughts and feelings I have of self-hatred and self-loathing and all those sorts of things are tied up with some of what happened to me and I guess part of what I needed to do was test this out in real life so to see whether actually other people were as horrified by me as I was um, and so my husband and my good friend Joe both uh, listened uh, as well as my therapist uh, when I needed to talk about this stuff and Joe, I don't think you watch my videos Joe, but if you do thank you and sorry a bit for no you would tell me off for saying sorry so I'm not going to say sorry so just thank you for for the time for the time um, I was going to say the time I cried in public with you that's happened many times the, the British Library uh, cafe time when I cried a lot for a really long time it was um, you know there are moments which are kind of pivotal and that was quite a pivotal one for me um, I mean I cried a lot it was really bad it I mean 
yeah, I don't think I've ever probably cried so much in my whole life. Um, but, but, um, it was, it was incredibly cathartic. And you know what I found out that day? That Joe didn't judge me for what had happened to me and what I'd done and, and, and that kind of thing. He didn't judge me. He was still my very good friend that day, the next day, forever. Um, and I needed to know that. And um, you don't find that out by keeping those thoughts in your head and guessing and making assumptions about what other people will think of you. You find that out by actually telling them this stuff in real life and discovering that, yeah, my husband still loves me. Yeah, my best friend's still my best friend. It's all good. Um, and um, that all sounds really easy and nice now, but at the time it was uh, hard. So there you go, they, those were the, the three things. I'm sure I have like a hundred more, but I'm aware that I've already waffled for a really, really quite incredibly long time. Um, this is partly, I think, because I've spent the last few days in bed with flu and um, I haven't really spoken to anyone for days. And not, I don't talk to that many people all the time anyway, really. Um, I'm, I am a bit of a recluse. I know I come across as like really, um, yeah, sociable and everything, but I, I, yeah, I don't talk to people much, but I do talk to people normally more than not at all. Um, and yeah, the last four or five days I've basically been asleep um, or watching YouTube videos. Um, yeah, so sorry about the warbling. Um, I hope it gave you a bit of an insight. Um, I'd love to hear your experiences of EMDR. What are the three things or even one thing? What do you wish you had known before you embarked on EMDR? Or if you're thinking about it, um, what would you like to know? What's the kind of, you know, the thing that's maybe holding you back or the thing that you're wondering about or your you're kind of worrying about because um, again you know we can answer more questions and I can answer them both from a you know my personal experience point of view but also from the point of view of having spoken with quite a lot of people now who've been through this kind of therapy but also from having done you know quite a bit of research into this um, and being able to talk about it from a relatively well informed point of view too and divorcing my own feelings from it if we wish to. Okay I, I hope that was somewhat insightful and interesting um, and rambling and I'm sorry um, but you know <laughs> thanks for watching um, and and yeah actually I find quite often that my more rambly more personal videos get more views than the ones where I try really hard to keep them succinct to make them really practical and on point so um, thank you for watching genuinely um, and do please consider subscribing I'm, I'm trying to get better at putting out regular content on my YouTube channel tune in on Tuesdays and Fridays um, and yeah maybe by the time you're watching this I'm one of those people who goes I recently hit a thousand subscribers I did and I'm proud um, but when you're watching this maybe I'm like at you know 10,000 and I'll go oh remember the days when I only had a thousand maybe you're the you know one of the early oh whatever shut up Pookie oh yeah I'm done bye